Okay, we are recording. We're going to be live. We're going to get rolling in just a minute. Give people a minute to join. We're going to share it on the various social media platforms and we're going to have a fantastic, exciting time with uh, this week's Parsha. So give us a moment here to share it and we will be rolling. Okay, we shared it in one place. One more second. And there we go. Very good. Okay. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I'm glad to be back. We missed one week for Hanukkah because it was the night of our menorah parade. Um, and we missed the week, well, actually we had one of the night of the menorah parade, we missed the week before, and uh, we missed the week because of winter break, I was away with the family, but we're back and better than ever. And this week we celebrate the, uh, it's Shabbat Chazak, it's the Shabbos in which we, um, we conclude the book of Genesis, the book of Bereshis, we learn, we study the portion of Vayechi, and in the portion of Vayechi, we address the life of Jacob, but really the culmination of his life, the final 17 years of his life that he lived in Egypt with his family as they descended to Egypt. And so I'm gonna, the, the foundation of tonight's class is based on a story, a story that took place a couple of, you know, 150, a little more than 150, maybe closer to 200 years ago. And even though for the last couple months we've been studying the third volume of the Rebbe's edited talks, the Rebbe's edited talks from the Kutzichis, I was asked to give a class tonight as part of a larger project called Project Lekutzichis, where tens of thousands of Jews around the world are studying the Rebbe's edited talks every week, and they are studying volume 10 of the Rebbe's edited talks. So I jumped from volume 3 to volume 10, and we're going to study the first talk of Vayichi in volume 10. It's a fabrengan of the Rebbe from this week's portion from 19, in the early, the beginning of 1972, Parshas Vayichi, Tapshin Lamed And I find it to be an incredibly fascinating talk. It also has incredible, um, valuable information for how we are to deal with our day-to-day -day life as the Rebbe always tried to do. So the Rebbe begins this talk with a story. And he says as follows, that the previous Rebbe, his father-in-law, Rabbi Yosef Yitzchak, shared the following tale, that when the Tzemach Tzedek, when the third Chabad Rebbe, Rebbe whose name was Menachem Mendel, the Tzemach Tzedek, was a child, and he was learning this week's Torah portion where it says, Vayechi Yaakov Be'eretz Mitzrayim Shvayas Rishana, that Jacob lived in the land of Egypt for 17 years, Tirgim Loimoiroi, his teacher, the Tzemach Tzedek's teacher, translated the verse, explained the verse to the Tzemach Tzedek based on the incredible interpretation of the Baal HaTurim. And what was the interpretation? What did the teacher tell this child, the Tzemach Tzedek? That the 17 years, the best 17 years of Jacob's life were lived in Egypt. So it's based on the teaching of the Baal Turim, one of the primary commentators of the Chumash, of the five books of Moses. But the Tzemach Tzedek's teacher told this child with the other students in the class, I assume there was other students, he said to him that the primary, the best, the favorite years, the most prime years of Jacob's life were lived in Egypt. The, ba the Baal Turim explains that the, 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 it was 17 years that he lived in Egypt, right? After he went down to see Joseph. 17 is Yud Zion. Yud Zion, the numerical value is Yud Zion, which is the same numerical value of the word Toiv, right? Toiv is Tes is nine, Vav is six, so it's 15, and Bez is two is 17. So the Toiv, the good years of Jacob were the years that he lived in Egypt. And Semach Tzedek as a child was no pushover, even though later he became a rebel, but even as a child, he was no pushover. He came home. 
And he said to his grandfather, the Alter Rebbe, Rav Shneir Zalman, the one who raised him, he said to him, how is it possible that Jacob, our patriarch Yaakov Avinu Jacob, who was the Bechira of us, he was the epitome, the ultimate of all three of the founding fathers of Judaism, right? Abraham had a son, Ishmael, Isaac had a son, Esau, Jacob had 12 perfect tribes. How is it that Jacob's primary best years were living in a depraved land like Egypt? Isn't it seemingly a contradiction, says the child to his grandfather? What does his grandfather, the Alter Rebbe, respond to the child to the Samach Tzedek? He said, if you look at last week's Torah portion, Jacob told Yehuda, told Judah, that Judah was sent by, jo by Jacob to Joseph's land, to Egypt, to, set, to, to bring instruction. What does it mean, bring instruction? So the Alter Rebbe told his grandson that the Medrash, which is quoted in Rashi, says that Rabbi Nechemia taught that he sent him to Egypt to set up a study place that over there they will study Torah and the tribes will be able to toil, to be diligent and toil in their Torah study. Because when you study Torah and you become close to God, then even when you're in Egypt, you're able to have vayechi, you're able to be alive. And he said to him in Yiddish, the grandfather, the Alter Rebbe said to his grandson, as me learn Torah, when you learn Torah, you become close to God. And even in Mitzrayim, even in Egypt, you, be, you can become alive. That was the story told by the previous Rebbe about the Tzemach Tzedek and his grandfather when the Tzemach Tzedek was a child. Every story about righteous people, every story that's shared with us in life, Every detail in the life of righteous people, even, ch even children, the details of the story, not just the story themselves, but the details matter. Therefore, if we hear a story like this and it's being told to us, we need to focus on the nuances, focus on the details and see what are we to garner in our service of God from this story. So when we look at the story of the Tzemach Tzedek's question and the answer from the Alter Rebbe, even though it was asked by a child, you know, it says in the Gemara, the Talmud says, <coughs> Butzin, butzin, mekatsi idea. If you want to know what kind of pumpkins are going to grow and how the pumpkins are going to grow when they get bigger and older, you have to look at the sap. If you check the sap out on the tree, you'll know what kind of pumpkins will grow. So if you look at a child, especially children that eventually become righteous people, you get a little of an, you get a good idea of what you're dealing with if you if you really zoom into the details of the questions and discussions they had even as children. And so if the Alter Rebbe explained this explanation about Jacob's life in Egypt, because he sent Judah to set up study halls where the tribes can study and be diligent in Torah study, even in Egypt, the question and the answer spoken to this child are very relevant to every one of us, even to those that may be children in our service of God, maybe not on the passport, right? We may be, uh, you know, in age, we may, be, we, we may be older, but somehow um, in the spiritual journey, we may still be children. And therefore, if we look at the story of a child's discussion with his grandfather, it will be valuable and helpful to us in our service of God. So there's three questions, three questions that the, Re that the Rebbe in this, uh, in this 70s talk, and look at the Sikhs, volume 10, addresses about this story. First of all, the Alter Rebbe didn't answer the question. The child comes home and says to his grandfather, Zayda, I have a question. How is it possible that my teacher taught me in school that Jacob's best years of his life were lived in Egypt, in a depraved, unspiritual, unholy country like Egypt? That was the child's question. What did the Alter Rebbe answer? That if you study Torah and you set up houses of Torah study, you can lift yourself up that even in Egypt, you can be connected and you can have a good life spiritually. That doesn't answer the question. All that says is that even in Egypt, you can live a decent, healthy, spiritual life. It doesn't say why specifically in Egypt, Jacob's, Jacob lived 147 years. He was 130 when he went down to Egypt. 130 years of Jacob 
are small potatoes compared to the 17 final years he lived in a depraved country like Egypt. Yes, his son was the viceroy. And yes, he, was, he merited to see his son. But the Alter Rebbe didn't really answer the question. Why was the best years in Egypt? Secondly, the, the, when the Tzemach Tzedek asked the question, he was at an age where he was simply quoting from his teacher, right? The teacher said, the Balaturim teaches. So when you're talking to a child of that age, it seems, it doesn't seem age appropriate for the Alter Rebbe, instead of just quoting Rashi's explanation that Jacob sent Judah to Egypt to set up study halls of Torah, that wasn't enough for the Alter Rebbe. He needed to quote, tell him that it's the Medrash that Rashi quotes. Why do you have to tell him that it's the Medrash? You're talking to a kid. It seems like too much information for a child, right? It wasn't enough for him to know that it's Rashi. He had to tell him that the Medrash that Rashi quotes. And thirdly, on this exact topic, Rashi says that when it says Judah was sent down to bring instruction in Goshen, in Egypt, that he was sent to set up study halls. But that's not what the Alter Rebbe quoted to the Tzemachtel. The Alter Rebbe specifically quoted the addition that it says in the Medrash. What does it say in the Medrash? It says that he said study, he set up that Judah was sent to set up study halls of Torah in Egypt. But then he adds, the Shiyu Hashvatim Hoigim Betorah, that the tribes will be able to study Torah diligently. It wasn't enough to say that they'll set up studies of houses of Torah study. You had to tell us that the tribes will study Torah diligently in those study halls. And if we're going to focus on the nuances, if we're going to get to the details and tr really try to understand this conversation, because this is not just a conversation about the Tzemach Tzedek and his grandfather, right? In Hasidism, if you open up the books of Hasidic tales, there are tens and tens of volumes of, of incredible, inspirational Hasidic tales. But if it's a tale that isn't just shared by Hasidim, if it's tales that are shared by the Rebbe's themselves, and in this case, the previous Rebbe of Yosef Yitzchak, that means that the details of the story that were shared, uh, the general story, but then the details themselves, the people involved, the age of the people, the time frame, the quotes, the sources, every detail of them, matters so that we can truly understand something about Jacob's life in Egypt that was not understood without knowing this story. So to really get to the, to the bottom of this conversation between the Tzemach Tzedek and his grandfather, let's ask another basic question, a really basic question if you're studying this week's Parsha. And that is, the Tzemach Tzedek was all baffled Right? He comes home from school, he's all baffled about why his teacher would say that the 17 primary years of Jacob were in Egypt. Now, the, the concept itself isn't such a foreign concept because it's obvious that Jacob's, the, the primary joy of Jacob, the pleasure of Jacob was that he saw, not only that he saw that Joseph was alive, but that he saw that Joseph was living the way Jacob had instructed him and taught him to live, right? We always talk about the incredible reunification of Jacob and his son Joseph, who he hadn't seen in 22 years. But the truth is, it wasn't just about seeing his son. It was about the fact that his son Yosef was still fully functioning as Jacob's son, as Yaakov's son. He lived he lived the lifestyle, right? When he sees his son, Yosef, still remaining a righteous person, even though being in Egypt, in the brave land of Egypt for so long, that was a great joy. And this is also understood from basic understanding of the verses with Rashi, as we go through the story two weeks ago and last week and now this week in the Parsha, right? When, when, um, when Jacob hears the news that his son, Yosef, is alive, it says, by Yafik Liboy, his heart was calmed. His heart was soothed. When he saw the wagons, he sent wagons laden with all the goods of Egypt. He sent almonds and gifts. He sent all this wonderful stuff from Egypt. And it says about the Chi Ruach Yaakov and the spirit of Jacob was revived. Why? Not because he saw wagons. You think Jacob needed some wagons with some gifts from Egypt? 
He just found out that his son Joseph was alive. Why would the wagons be so impressive? So the, we're told in Rashi that wagons in Hebrew are agalot. That's the Hebrew word. It was, Jake, it was Joseph sending Jacob a subtle message. When Joseph was being led by his father, when Jacob led Joseph towards, um, towards Dyson, remember when the brothers went out and they were missing and, and Jacob wanted to find out where they were a few weeks ago, and then Jacob walks with Joseph, you know, he, he escorts him, and eventually Joseph goes on his own to try to find the brothers, and he sold them to slavery. The last thing that Jacob taught Joseph was the laws of Eglah Rufa, the, the concept in Judaism of Eglah Rufa, which is if God forbid you ever find a dead body, a deceased body, in between cities, the limits of two different cities, you measure which city the body was closest to, and there's a whole procedure and process where the rabbis of the city have to take responsibility for the fact that this person wasn't cared for, which is why he ended up dead in the middle of the highway, middle of the road. That process where they decapitate the head of a calf is called egla rufa. Egla, the word in Hebrew for a calf is egla, and the word in Hebrew for a wagon is agola. It's the same letters, ayin gimel lamed hey. When Joseph sent the agalot, when he sent the wagons to, um, when he sent the wagons to his father, he knew that Yaakov, his father Jacob, would understand what it was about. He was hinting to his father that he didn't forget the last thing his father had taught him. And when ja when Jacob recognized that Batachi Ruach Yaakov Avin, he became alive and he became alive. He was excited. It meant that his son Joseph had spirit had retained retained his spiritual connection and his holy behavior, even being in depraved Egypt. And that's why when Jacob comes to Joseph in Egypt, when he finally comes down to Egypt, he says, after I saw your face and I knew that you were alive. Did, did, um, did Jacob really need to see Joseph's face in order to know that Joseph was alive? Wasn't there enough hints already? Um, wasn't there enough hints already from the, uh, sorry about that, wasn't there enough hints that um, the brothers came and, and Joseph sent gifts and he sent hints. There was, so, there was so many reasons to believe he was alive. He had to see his face. So the commentators tell us that it wasn't about seeing Joseph's face physically. When he saw Joseph and he saw that Joseph was alive, meaning that Joseph was living the way a living Jew should live. That's what J Jacob said, Yaakov said, when I saw your face and I saw the holiness and I saw the spirituality and I saw that you're living the way I would have wanted you to live, he was joyous. Therefore, it's obvious, it's obvious based on all that information that we've studied over the last three weeks that Jacob's joy seeing Joseph was like the joy of seeing light from the vantage point of darkness. Lighting a candle when the sun is shining in all its glory doesn't impress anybody. The light from the candle does nothing. But like King Solomon says in Proverbs, Ki or like the, the value, the plus of having light coming from darkness. So it's obvious to all, and including a child studying Rashi and Chumash, every child understands that Jacob's joy for his reunion with Joseph was based on the pleasure that he garnered and the nachas that was attributed to what he saw in Joseph's lifestyle with himself, with his wife, with his two children, Ephraim and Manasseh. Therefore, why was the Tzamat Tzedek so baffled by what his teacher told him? His teacher told him that Jacob's best years of his life were the 17 years that he lived in Egypt, which is based on what the Balaturim teaches. Why was the Tzamaq Tzedek a smart, studious, receptive student who studied Torah? Why was, he so, why was he so baffled by that concept that his teacher taught him that he had to go back and question his grandfather about it? And then his grandfather explains to him that you want to know that his favorite years in Egypt, his best years in Egypt were because... He had set up study halls, and if you study Torah, you can remain above the fray. You can remain connected even when you're surrounded by negative environment and unhealthy, unspiritual influence. So the question must have been, 
a deeper question, not a superficial one, because on a very basic level, everyone that studies the Torah understands why Jacob was super, super delighted to spend his final years with Joseph and Joseph's family and all the other tribes in Egypt. So what the Rebbe does here is the Rebbe gives us a little bit of a crash course on spirituality. And he says as follows. Mitzrayim, the name of the country, but also the concept, the word Mitzrayim comes from the word, the word for Egypt, comes from the word Mitzorim Ugvulim, comes from the world of narrowness, limitation, boundaries. And it represents a country that doesn't, doesn't allow for divine revelation. It doesn't allow for infinite godliness to reveal itself. It's limiting, it's mitzorim, it's choking. It doesn't let the godliness come out of its hole and reveal itself. It doesn't allow infinite godliness that should reign freely do its thing. Furthermore, not only doesn't it not, doesn't it, not only it doesn't allow godliness to reign freely, Egypt was known not only as Mitzrayim, but what was its title? What was its nickname? Ervat Haaretz. The depravity, the depravity of the land, right? It was a place of sin. It was a place that we call in mystical terms and Hasidic terms and Kabbalistic terms, klipot, it's a place of the shell, right? Every beautiful fruit for protection has a beauty. Hashem created that has a shell around it. The shell has no value other than the fact that it's concealing the beautiful fruit that exists within it. Uh, our family was on a trip this week and, 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 and while we were horseback riding, one of the, one of the uh, guides who actually grew up in Queens throws something. I mean, he says, here, take a bite. It's something called parcha. Turns out in English, they call it passion fruit, but he literally just whipped it off the tree right where we were horseback riding in the rainforest, opened it up, we made a bracha. It was the most sweet, delicious thing in the world. No one wants to eat the shell, the peel. You're looking for the, the beauty that's inside that. Egypt was a manifestation of the peel. It was a shell. It was a place that by definition, by lifestyle, by behavior, concealed godliness. It choked and concealed and limited the divine revelation. But what is the ultimate service of a human being when a human being encounters a situation where the godliness in their life is being concealed and choking, it's being limited? is to have Yitziat Mitzrayim, the exodus from Egypt, which is that we should be able to leave this limitation, leave this suffocation, and come to a place where the infinite, ain't so, unyielding, never-ending light of God is shining freely, which will allow us to serve God in an unlimited, infinite fashion as well. And so when this child at Samach Tzedek who grew up in a home, he grew up in a place where spirituality and holiness was the, was the way of life. That's how they lived. His question wasn't just a superficial question based on what his teacher told him in school. It was so much deeper. What he's, he was saying was, yes, the 17 years of Jacob's life where he had all this spiritual pleasure, um, which he couldn't have up until then because he never had to deal with the negativity and the, the darkness and limitations of Egypt before. But he said to his grandfather, going to Egypt to this depraved land where there's so much concealment, right, makes it so hard to deal and to reveal the godliness. So he said to his aide, he said to his grandfather, I get why there was holiness. I get why it was special. I get why he enjoyed it. But his best years? You're talking about a guy like Jacob who lived um, many, many of his years. Of course, he lived by Laban too. <coughs> but he lived many, many of his years in Israel, in the Holy Land, in Olat Tmima, like a burnt offering to God in Kodesh HaKadoshim, in the, in the Holy of Holies. He was living a life of holiness in the Holy Land. So I get that there's a lot of bonuses and a lot of pluses about, about dealing with the darkness and overcoming the darkness and, and, and revealing godliness in the darkness, but his best years? What does his grandfather, his aide of the Alter Rebbe, answer him? That his kinloy based Talmud, that Jacob sent Judah to set up study halls, because if you have Torah, 
right? When a Jew can study Torah and elevate himself or herself above all the limitations of the environment they may find themselves in, they can elevate themselves to vayichi, to true life, to true vigor, and being enlivened even in a place like Egypt. Why? Because Torah is connected to, the, Torah is the essence of God, right? And anyone that studied Tanya chapter five, which is right in the beginning of the 53 chapters of Tanya in chapter five, the Alter Rebbe teaches this concept that the unity and the union that takes place in a Jewish person's mind when they study Torah is a union unlike any other spiritual union or physical union that exists in the world. Because, the, because God embedded his essence, his etzim, into his wisdom. Because when you're talking about a God, you can't separate his wisdom from himself. God is not a human being that has a brain and a heart and a, and a liver and a, and a kidney. It's God's wisdom, which is one with God because there is no division or fragmentation within God. Therefore, the Torah is God's essence. And when you study God's essence, your brain is now one with God's essence. So no matter what your environment is, even if you're in Egypt, even if you're in a place of spiritual suffocation and limitation, if you study Torah, the Alter Rebbe tells his grandson, you can uplift yourself and be above the Egyptian suffocation. You could be above the unholiness that existed. And therefore, by sending Judah to set up the study halls in Egypt, it was not only, not only was Egypt not a descent, a spiritual lowly time for the tribes and for Jacob, but they were totally not under the jurisdiction of Egypt altogether. So even while in Egypt, they weren't really in Egypt. So it's an interesting concept because it goes back to a concept we discussed a couple of weeks ago that the body could be in exile. A soul, if a soul is connected and is uplifted. And the only way to do that is if a soul is connected to its source, to its God, which is through Torah, the environment doesn't affect you. You're not even there. Jacob was in a place where his favorite, his, his, he, he could have 17 incredible years in a place like Egypt, despite Egypt being depraved and unethical and unholy and unspiritual and a, and a place of sinfulness, because he was Jacob. And when you set up study halls and you bring Torah and you see the world through the vision, through the, um, the lens of Torah, and you live that life, I said a couple of weeks, I think it was, um, I think it was back in, in November that I shared there was a, that there was a chassid who was sitting in the, in, uh, and it's a, it's a story that took place when one of the czars died and the next czar took over and he was sitting in the shul and everyone was talking about how the new czar took over. And he looked up from his siddur or from his prayer, his prayer book or from his, uh, from his sefer. And he's like, I don't understand. We just got an, didn't we just get one? Something to that effect. Turns out he didn't realize that it was 25 years in between from when the Lazar to the new czar. It was all the same to him. He wasn't keeping track. He was living in his own world, the world of Torah and davening. And who the czar was, was irrelevant. You can live in a place like Egypt, says the Rebbe, based on the story. And be like Jacob, I'll set up, a, I'll send Judah, we'll set up a study hall, we'll live in a world of Torah, we'll live in a perspective of God, or in self, the unlimited, unyielding, powerful, bright light of God shines through Torah into us, and therefore Egypt doesn't affect us. But that still doesn't answer one part of the question. Why were the best years in Egypt? We get why Egypt didn't affect Jacob. We get why it could have been good years for Jacob, even though he was in Egypt, because he knew how to stand above, and be above the fray. As we say in Yiddish, one tefach off the ground, one hand breath off the ground. But why the best years? And for that, to answer that part of the question, the Alter Rebbe quoted the Medrash, not just the Rashi that says they set up study halls, but specifically the measures that says that the Shvat and the tribes would sit in the study halls and study diligently, which is a term for diligent study, they would study Torah. So you have to, to, to understand why he would do that, right? The Tzemach Tzedek, when he asked the question, was a child. But later, when the Tzemach Tzedek was older, he explained as follows. That when Jacob lived for the 17 years in Egypt, 17 is the numerical value, like we said earlier, of toiv, which is good. That through the 17 years of in Egypt, 
he merited, listen to this, this is Hasidic philosophy 101, that through the 17 years of Jacob in Egypt, he merited by, to the level of Ayichi, to be alive, what does that mean? To see the good, like the, the, like, like the light that you see coming from darkness. So I want to take a moment here to share with you something that I thought about a few times today because it's a, it's a, it's a powerful concept, but it's also, and it's something the Rebbe quotes in this talk, but it's also very deep. He says as follows, there's two ways to understand this concept of the light that comes from darkness, right? So the first way is that, the first way to understand it is that there's a place of darkness and then you bring in this powerful infinite light and through the light, you recognize how, th that when you shine the light on the darkness, even though the darkness is very, very strong, you could see how powerful the light is because it takes away even that darkness. Even though the darkness was real or seemingly real and the light comes in, it bombards with lots of strong light and now there's no more darkness anymore, it's all light. And you go, wow, before it looked dark and now there's light and the light is so strong, you got rid of the darkness. The second way of understanding it is that when the light comes in, it actually allows you to realize, right? What's the light that comes from darkness? It's to reach a point that the darkness itself, itself starts shining. That the darkness itself becomes part of the light process. And what that does is actually show you the power of the light, that it has the ability to even encourage and inspire and transform darkness into becoming light. Which one's greater? Which interpretation? Which way of seeing this is greater? So the Rebbe says like this. The first way we understood that the light is so powerful that it comes and it takes away the darkness, what that basically does is tell you that it doesn't accept the darkness as a reality. There is no darkness. The darkness is the absence of light. The minute real infinite light comes into the picture, the darkness is gone. And that's the power of Light, the power of light is that it could take away even the greatest darkness because darkness isn't that real. It's such a flimsy concept darkness that light can just bombs away and there's no more darkness. And so what Shloyma Melech, what King Solomon me meant when he said, like the light that you see coming from darkness is the ability to recognize the flimsiness of darkness when light comes into the picture. And we see this in reality. You take a little candle into a dark room, you see that reality. In other words, it's the perspective that people like Jacob live by. What do I mean by that? People like Jacob who are superpowers of light, the darkness has zero effect on them. The minute they come into the picture, the darkness is gone. They are the representation of light. Darkness never affects them, not negatively, not positively. It doesn't affect them at all. The minute they show up, they are epitome of light. Darkness is gone. So they live above the darkness. And sure, it proves the power of light over darkness. But it doesn't really deal with the darkness at all. It just disperses the darkness. But then there are people that are not like Jacob meaning they're not spiritually at that point. They're real people in the real world that deal with real life issues. And they definitely have a perception of the second understanding. And that is that there is darkness. It is real. Now we have to go there and transform the darkness. How do I take my weakness? How do I take my darkness? How do I take this unholiness? and transform it not only to not be an obstacle, but transform it to be part of the solution and, and join ranks with the light as being part of team light, right? So if, if the Alter Rebbe would have told the Tzemach Tzedek just, half, just what Rashi said, that, the, that, that Jacob sent Judah to set up study halls, it'd be basically sticking to the Jacob philosophy, set up, set up study halls, 
Don't deal with the reality of darkness. We're just going to go straight from Israel into our study halls. We're going to live above the fray. We're never going to have to deal with the darkness because darkness isn't real for us. And through our light, we will remain strong and steadfast in our relationship with God despite what's going on around us and the darkness will have no effect on us. These are the types of souls like Jacob that are connected to the, you know, there's in the, in the realms of worlds, our four worlds in mystical teachings, Atzilut, the world of emanation, the world, and then there's Biyah, the, the lower three, Bria, Yitzira, Asiya, the world of creation, the world of formation, and the world of action. The Jacobs of the world are connected to the world of Atzilut, like Moses. They're connected to the world of emanation. That works perfect for them. What about the rest of us? We're not super light, we're not super powers of light. We're not on the level of Atzilut. We're, we're, we're Jews that are connected to the to the Bri Yitzir Asir, to the worlds of creation, formation, and most of us just to the world of action. We're just day-to-day -day people trying to survive and deal with the darkness. How do we have this concept that Shlomo Amelech King Solomon says, Ki achoshuk, like the light that comes from darkness? How do we exhibit that in our lives? That's why the Alter Rebbe quoted the rest of the Medrash, not just the Rashi that says he set up study holes and then he added from the Medrash for the tribes to sit and be diligent in Torah study. The tribes were not Jacob. The tribes were um, shepherds. They were people of the earth. They were connected very much to the lower three worlds. And therefore we can relate to them more, and especially when he's talking to his young grandson at Samach Tzedek. So even though for Jacob, it's fantastic. He didn't need to worry about all these challenges of darkness because when light shows up, infinity gets rid of finite darkness. It doesn't even exist, the finite darkness in his world. For the rest of us, we need to know that we have the ability not to immediately get rid of darkness and, and, and live in a world where it doesn't exist even better than that. We have something that Jacob didn't have. We have something that the tribes have, which is the ability to see the darkness, recognize that it is real, and recognize that we have the ability to turn the darkness on its head and make it part of team light. And that is why, that, so that's why the Alter Rebbe shared that end of the Medrash with the Tzemach Tzedek. But he also didn't make it, he didn't, he didn't tell his grandson clearly, right? He didn't say, listen, grandson, my dear Anakul, I want you to know that there's something really special about having the dark challenges. So this is, this is first of all, it's a lesson in parenting, or maybe in this case, a lesson in grandparenting because it was a grandfather to a grandson, but it's also a lesson in life. And again, nuance, it matters. So the Alter Rebbe wanted to teach his grandson something incredible about Jacob. And that is that Jacob lived above the fray, but he also took into consideration the reality of what others would have to deal with when they would deal with darkness. But he didn't want to tell his grandson straightforward, hey, by the way, there's something really powerful about being um, a person who has a very dark side or dealing with a very dark element. Meaning we all know that if you study Hasidus, we are taught that there's something very powerful about someone who experiences challenges, has a rough life and deals with those challenges, both spiritual and physical. We know there's something very powerful about a Baal Tshuva, about someone that does re, re, returns to God and repentant, uh, uh, experiences a high level of return, Tshuva, repentance, a penitent, and the idea that they have the ability to transform their most, um, their most the negative previous experiences into something positive. That's one of the beauties. The deliberate sins that they did are now transformed into merits because they were part of the process of them coming closer to God. But you don't tell that to a kid. Because if you tell that to a child, what do you think the child's going to learn from that? Oh, grandpa told me, Zadie told me, that if I sin and I do tshuva, I can reach a very high spiritual level. That if I have great challenges in my life, eventually things are going to really work out. You tell that to a child, you're basically telling the child that they should look for trouble. So even though the Alter Rebbe wanted to convey that message to the Tzemach Tzedek, he did it very subtly. He hinted to the Medrash. It was only later when the Tzemach Tzedek was older himself and he was already a Rebbe that he elaborated on why Jacob's 17 most prominent years were in Egypt. The reason why Jacob's most prominent years were in Egypt 
So he answered his question, but it wasn't clear that it was an answer until later when you could figure out what he meant. What he meant to tell him was that his most incredible 17 years were there because he got to have a taste of what the average Jew deals with, which is deal with darkness, see the reality of the negativity and watch it be transformed into something positive. And there's nothing, even living in Israel, living a holy life in Israel can compete with the holiness that is garnered and the reception, the spiritual receptors that we have in our, in our, in our psyche, in our spiritual psyche, to receive great divine revelation when we go through that process of becoming a Baal You can't do that deliberately, right? It says clearly that if someone says, I'll sin and then I'll do tshuva, God doesn't accept the tshuva. You can't work that program. You can't tell a kid, hey, make sure to mess up so you can do tshuva later and you'll really be on God's good terms. So he only hinted it to him, right? We say every morning in our prayer, in the morning, brachot and brachot ashachar, we say, God, please don't give us any more tests. We ask God, don't put us in that position. But only if we are in that position, if we end up in that position for one reason or another, we should know, how to, we should know that it's, we have the ability to transform that situation into something very, very powerful. And that's really a lesson for life for all of us that, you know, when we, generally we should run away from darkness in the first moment we encounter it, just run. You see darkness, take off. Don't be a chacham and say, oh, now I'm going to start, let me start dealing with the darkness. No, no, no. You see darkness, run for the hills. If it's coming towards you, if unholiness is tempting you, run. <laughs> but if you couldn't make it away quick enough and you got stuck and now you're being suffocated and limited, mitzrayim, you're being in this narrow space of darkness, make it your best years of your life. Turn it, not only survive, but make a dwelling place for God right there in the praved land of Egypt, in the suffocation, through connecting to God through Torah, connecting to Atzilut, we can elevate ourselves to a place where in the darkness, in the suffocation, suddenly we find the greatest, the greatest breathing room. We're not suffocated anymore. Not only we got away from the person suffocating us, the entity suffocating us, but we have lifted ourselves above to a place where the oxygen is incredible. And it's important to remember that because sometimes even the greatest people fall into a trap. And when you get into that trap and you're like, oh my gosh, how did I end up here? I should have, I should have resisted. I should have never succumbed to the temptation. Okay, very good. You're right. You should have not done that. But you did. There's a process. And that process is so powerful that it could be your greatest years of your life. You still pray to God every day. God, don't make my life hard. God, don't give me more challenges. I don't know. I can't handle it. Take it away. I, don't, I can't. Don't give me any more tests and challenges. Don't test me with spiritual, physical, material, mental, emotional, personal, any type of temptation, any type of challenge. But God, if you try me, I know from Father Jacob and his tribes that I have what it takes to get over this challenge. And just in case there's any of you at home, and it's funny that the Rebbe forewarned this, you know, 50 years ago. In, in this talk, in case there's any of you at home that are jealous because you've never had that temptation, you've never been in that place of darkness, and therefore you'd like to also have these incredible years of dealing with the darkness and transforming it, but you simply are so special that you haven't encountered that level of darkness. I don't have that problem, but maybe some of you do. You've never encountered that level of darkness. Says the Rebbe, don't worry, I have a solution for you. If you're looking to experience the light that comes from that level of darkness, the second level of Yitron HaOr Minachoshev, the second interpretation, which is that there is darkness and that I have to deal with the darkness, but I'm going to transform the darkness. But you say to yourself, I don't have that darkness. And therefore, I don't have the ability to experience the bliss and the euphoria that you experience when you overcome that darkness and you brighten the darkness and you bring the darkness onto team light, what do you do? Says the Rebbe, yeah, I have a solution. Find a Jew, or maybe more than one Jew, who isn't so lucky like you and does encounter darkness and help them reveal the light within their darkness. And by doing so, now you've experienced, you see what it's like, you're getting a little taste of it, but you don't have to schlep yourself to Egypt for that. 
You don't have to be in a state of suffocation of Egypt. It's enough that you're helping someone leave their suffocation, transform their bondage, their limitation, their boundaries, their negative dark situation into good. And now you're part of that process. You get a taste of the incredible spiritual and holy value that exists in that second level of seeing the light that comes from the darkness. And so going back to where we started, it's a Tzedek, this young child comes home and says, this Zayda, Zayda, I don't understand why J Jacob's best years were in Egypt. And what did Zayda really answer him? He said, we all have the ability to remain above the fray, even in the darkest and most limited places. But he also hinted to him that the reason for Jacob was the greatest years because it was the years of his life that he got together with the tribes, through the tribes perhaps, he had the ability to tap into a spiritual journey, a spiritual service that was very unlike what he needed or wanted or was connected to, which is the ability to see how we can take darkness, transform it into team light. And uh, I think Abe Lincoln was the one who said that uh, I can't quote it, I definitely can't quote it live on a class, but he said something about his enemies being inside his tent, fighting the ones outside of his tent. He'd rather bring his enemies into the tent to fight the ones outside than having them outside fighting him. And so when you see darkness, instead of being so scared of darkness, ask yourself, how can I do what Jacob and the tribes did? How can I get darkness to be on my side? How can I take this weakness and turn it into my greatest asset? And if I can do that, if we can do that, then Egypt won't be as scary as it seems and Exodus will come a lot sooner than we could have ever imagined. And that's the taste of the Sicha from volume 10. I hope it brings you inspiration like it brought me inspiration. I look forward to seeing you guys back here next Wednesday, seven o'clock, God willing. And of course, we're doing our morning inspirations every day at 7.30 a.m. Mountain Standard Time. If you'd like to join, just let me know. Zeigesund, and we'll see you back soon.